God has prepared for those who love thee such good things as past man's understanding. Pour into our hearts such love towards thee that we, loving above all things, may strive and love those things you've promised to us, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A 19th century hymn, Epiphany 135. Songs of thankfulness and praise. Jesus, Lord, to thee we raise. Manifested by the star. To sages from afar. Branch of royal David's stem. In thy birth at Bethlehem. Anthems be to thee addressed. God and man made manifest. That's a very good hymn. Well, we turn our attention to... Um, G.E. writes the Bible in the ancient Near East essays in honor of, of Lord Foxwell Albright that we can only borrow for an hour so we pull it up here We, it ends at 3.33, so let's just go on ahead here. It's got a nice picture of uh, Dr. Albright, which I think I'm going to take the moment here, if you would bear with me, to save that. Um, there's not very many pictures out there of Albright. Well, let me do it. No. Okay. The Bible in the Ancient Near East, published by Doubleday. Forward. This is by G.E. Wright. I think he was at Harvard. <coughs> the essays in this volume were presented in affection, respect to great scholar, teacher, and friend, William Foxwell Albright. During the past... The work of William Foxwell Albright during the past 40 or more years has been exceptionally learned, stimulant, not infrequently controversial on the front lines of Near Eastern scholarship. The Catholicity of interest which it represents is radically empirical emphasis in historical method. Its full employment of fresh linguistic, philological, and archaeological data to challenge older views and the form bases of new syntheses and new doctoral dissertations. These are at the root of the heuristic importance. <laughs> so concentrated has been the, the, the hubris of our age. Well, we have the that scientific impulse. Never mind the ancients. Oh, I can't stand it. It's getting more and more obnoxious as I get older and more I read. Yet such an impression can exaggerate the true situation unless it is realized that a single new fact discovered on the historical frontier can frequently challenge a given reconstruction if one is open to its meaning. Okay, let's see. Blah, blah, blah. Described the course taken by scholarly research since World War I, various areas of neat New Eastern study. I wish to thank Frank Cross, David Noel Friedman, he was at the University of Michigan, Pat Miller, James Ackerman, Holiday, Jans and Jenks, Lemke, Riemann, members of the departments of Harvard University. A matter of regret that this volume has been so long in preparation and certain of the chapters were completed long before the others. 1960, Cambridge as at Harvard. Contents. Modern study of Old Testament literature of John Bright. Uh, we're working with his history of the Old Testament. <coughs> he was a student, George Mendenhall, University of Michigan, Biblical History and Tradition. William Moore, a Hebrew language and Northwest Semitic background, Pontifical Biblical Institute. I had a New Testament man at Villanova from the Pontifical Biblical Institute. 
J.E. Wright, Harvard, Archaeology, Palestine. Textual Criticism of the Old Testament, Harry Orlinsky, Hebrew Union College, Development of Jewish Scripts, Frank Ross, Harvard. Chronology of Israel and Ancient Near East, David Noel Freedom, Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. I thought he was at the University of Michigan. I think he was. Ancient Near East, Chronological Bibliography and Charts, South Arabian History, Archaeology, Van Beek, Smithsonian Institution. Sumerian Literature, Samuel Kramer, University of Pennsylvania. Formal Tendencies in Sumerian Religion, Thor, Cole, Jacobson, Egypt, Egyptian Culture, Wilson, Hittite, and Anatolian Treaties. Albrecht Goetz, Getz, Yale University. And then a bibliography of Albright. That will be worth having. And it's got all the abbreviations of the scholarly journals. Page 11, page 12 is a blank. Page 13, chapter 1, a modern study of Old Testament literature. John Bright. It is fitting that a volume prepared in honor of Foxwell, William Foxwell Albright should begin with a chapter on biblical literature and criticism. For while it is possible that future generations will remember Professor Albright less as a biblical critic, sensu stricto, than for his countless contributions to linguistic science, archaeology, and the whole field of ancient oriental history. It is probable that few men of our times have affected the course of Old Testament stories more profoundly than he. More than this, he has awakened an interest in and imparted an understanding of the Bible to many students who have sat at his feet, as the present writer would gratefully would like to gratefully testify. Any attempt to describe and brief compass the course of biblical criticism over the last 35 years this published 1960 or since 1925 or after World War I, must of necessity be selective. It is manifestly impossible to take up the various books of the Bible one by one to review the history of discussion regarding them. No attempt to do so will be made here. We shall further confine ourselves to a description of some of the more significant trends which have manifested themselves in certain major areas of Old Testament study in the period with which we are concerned. I didn't see a tape. Uh, we did a table of contents, but there's no Walter Brueggemann in that bunch. Maybe he's too, too late, too modern. both because some selection must be made or remarks will be devoted to a recent discussion of the Pentateuch problem with studies, and they put Hextatuch in parentheses, but happy coincidence, it is precisely upon the problem of the Hesitute, Hextatuch that the contribution of William Albright Old Testament criticism has made its most decisive impact, hopefully explosion. One should begin by warning the reader that it is impossible to make general statements regarding any phase of biblical criticism today without running the risk of oversimplification. The whole field is in a state of flux. Yeah, tell us about JVP now. It's moving, certainly, but it's not always easy to say what direction. Sometimes it gives the impression that it's moving in several mutually canceling directions at once. It was a circular firing squad. Even upon a major events, there's often little unanimity to be observed. Yeah, shoot the guy at the next university. Blah, blah, blah in that paragraph. As regards the Hextatuch problem, one could have spoken 35 years ago of a consensus of scholarship. Critical studies of previous generations had erected a massive and seemingly well-attested structure, which, though vigorously combated by theological conservatives and still debated at many points, was accepted in virtually all the scholarly world. In spite of the rumblings of discontent which were beginning to make themselves heard, it seemed likely that the structure would stand. 
All that the future seemed to hold for it was further refinement, testing, and application. As late as 1928, no less than a ASP could say, the net result of the recent critical movement, it seems to me, is that we are left to the main very much where we were a quarter of a century ago in 1900. Reactionary and radical conclusions still have their representatives. New theories make their appearances from time to time. They probably contain their elements of truth and necessitate minor adjustments. The relative dating of the codes advocated by the Graphians, well, I am convinced, remain. And the absolute dating will also, I think, not be seriously altered. And in other departments of Old Testament criticism, I anticipate a similar maintenance of what I may call the central position He's quoting A.S. Peak there. As we shall see, this prediction has turned out to be both right and wrong. The critical orthodoxy of the day rested on two pillars, an analysis of the documents and theory with regard to the development of Israel's religion. It is important that the two be distinguished, for they do not necessarily hang together. Both have been erected through generations of study and have been joined in classical fashion in the work of Julius Bellhausen. The story of the development of the documentary hypothesis has been told many times and need not be repeated here. The documentary hypothesis represented an attempt to account for the variations of style, differences of viewpoint, reduplications of narrative and the like to be found in the Hextitute. A phenomenon which had been observed as far back as the 17th century had been explicitly the beginnings of John, Jean Ostrook, J.G. Eichhorn, who said the Old Testament canon was a failure, I added that, and others who'd suggested that Genesis at least was composed of two parallel accounts. By the second half of the 19th century, after generations of scholarly debate, it was becoming the accepted opinion that four major documents could be discerned running through the first six books of the Bible. Through the work of E. Royce and his pupil K. H. Groff, these had been in good part on the basis of the development of religion observable in them, arranged in order to which we are accustomed, J in the ninth century, E in the eighth century, D in the seventh, and P in the fifth. <laughs> oh, they're still yapping about it. The theory of the documents was taken over by Bethausen from Graf with general re generous recognition and given brilliant in vindication. To the theory of the documents, there was added at this time, most notably by Bethausen himself, a reconstruction of the history of Israel's religion. This had its ultimate origin in the philosophy of Hegel, as applied to the religion of it. Certain scholars of the school of WML de Bet, 1780-1849, notably JFL George and W. Vatke. It was held by proponents of this school that an evolutionary pattern was observable in all human history. And in the history of Israel, no less than elsewhere, it was assumed that Israel's religion developed, developed from the most primitive forms to the highest form within the Old Testament period, undergoing a fundamental change of character along. The religion of the Hebrew ancestors was customarily described as animism or polydemonism, which evolved first into national henotheism and finally as a result of the work of the prophets and the ethical monism of the exilic and post-exilic periods. The documents of the Hextatuch were ranged along the line in March of March, according to the level of religion exhibited in them, J and E, like the narratives of Judges and Samuel, reflecting the pre-prophetic school. 
D in the Deuteronomic, Deuteronomic histories and reform activity of the seventh century. P like chronicles the circumstances of the post-exilic community, the historical worth of these documents, centuries removed as they were from the events of which they purport to tell was held to be minimal. Indeed, they were valued almost exclusively for the light they cast on beliefs and practices of their respective period in which they were written and not as sources of information regarding the period of Israel's origins. <coughs> this was the theory that dominated Old Testament studies a generation ago, still does. Tell me otherwise. We're still teaching it. They're still publishing books with that. The man is a historical note, but that's sort of the way they're presenting it. I the name of the guy's book we were forced to teach. Had some fun there. Whether Hegelianism or positiveness or positivism or whatnot were the mode in which the general confidence in man's progress was abroad, prepared the way for its victory. To the mind of the day, it offered an explanation both of the problem of the Pentateuch and of the history of Israel's religion that seemed reasonable and satisfying. This guy's doing a good job of summarizing it. So we're laughing along here. We want to be very careful that uh, in giving a rebuke, we do it humbly. We're warned in Galatians 6 1, lest we succumb to the very temptation of the thing we're criticizing. But having said that, we could still have a good laugh now and then. Found embodiment scores of history commentary introduction handbooks, which are still in use today. It is probably 35 years ago, few could have believed that whatever be superseded. <laughs> as secure as this critical orthodoxy may have seemed then, forces were already at work, which would undermine it. Yeah, no kidding. These forces were various, many of them lying beyond the scope of this paper. Not least of them was the fact that the philosophic understructure upon which the whole scheme rested, which lent it to an aura of self-evidence, fell into discredit. After two total wars and countless other unmentionable horrors, few are left today who would find a melioristic evolution sufficient explanation of human history. World War II changed the direction of Old Testament scholarship. Well, I can see it. I mean, I was thinking of that as we're reading that silly, goofy stuff. Oh, we're getting better. We're in progress. You can see with these so-called goofy Democrats were progressives while we kill millions of babies, right? far along. Deprived of its philosophic rationale, the critical structure was left vulnerable. Uh, further within the realm of criticism itself, there was certainly a reaction against the ridiculous extremes to which the documentary analysis was sometimes carried. Analysis of extremes which taxed all credulity and threatened to discredit the whole procedure in the eyes of sober-minded people. More positively, the amazing um, access of knowledge regarding the ancient Orient and Israel, which re recent years have brought have served to throw the critical theories of yesterday into question and show that a revision of them is required so drastic as to him to virtual abandonment. This is the subject which lies outside our present concern, but mention of which must be made because of its enormous bearing on critical issues. When the founders of biblical criticism did their work, very little, if any, was known at the hand of the ancient Orient. And that's where Falk, uh, Albright comes in. He does all this archaeology stuff and then looks at the Germans and laughs at them. It was natural, therefore, for the early critics to view Israel in isolation against a foreshortened perspective to posit for her earliest period the crudest of beliefs, 
so to telescope the entire evolution of religion from primitive forms to ethical monotheism into the space of a few hundred years. All what was more, and what is more of the concern of this paper, it has become plain that the narratives of Israel's origins found in the Hextatuch, far from reflecting the circumstances of those later ages when the documents supposedly were written, reflect precisely whatever one may say of their historical worth, those of the second millennium of which we purport to tell and criticism has willy-nilly <laughs> been forced to take account of this fact. Further, as Israel's own history and constitution have been better appreciated, the fallacy of telescoping her religious development into too late a period has been underlined. To mention but one thing, the realization of the place of the tribal league, Amphictyoni, in the life of Israel has been of a capital importance. No longer can it be assumed, as was the custom, that Israel was first given unity there with a structure which an organized cultus and body of laws could develop only with the rise of the monarchy. Oh, we're having some fun here in this Old Testament class. Oh, man, it would be fun to go up there at the Libos and listen to them yak around. The Tribal League was itself a society founded in Yahweh's covenant. It was within that league that Israel's distinctive institutions, her cultists, were given their normative form. And the great traditionary saga of the patriarch's exodus and conquest, which comprises the bulk of the narrative portions of the Hexateuch, and from which both J and E seem to have drawn their material, was presumably likewise given a definitive shape at this time. It is generally agreed today, therefore, that a new approach to the biblical traditions is required. The older critics, it has long been realized, proceeded too largely on the assumption that the Hextatute was the product of a purely literary activity, which came into being by the editing together of written documents. They conceived their task, therefore, almost exclusively as that of unraveling these various strands that they might study each in isolation. Oh, yeah. The Axemen. It just, it, oh, it used to be awful reading this stuff. Jay said this, E said that. P over here, you couldn't keep it straight. He had a stinking scorecard. And then somebody come along and he'd have some other way to put the puzzle together. And you'd read this stuff, enormous complexity. You don't know what's going on. <laughs> uh, I, I, I just can't take any of these guys seriously. The pioneer was H. Gunkel, who was the first to apply the methods of form criticism to biblical studies, who gave early attention to certain traditions in Genesis. In light of the Babylonian parallels, he was followed by Gressman, applied the same methods to the traditions of Moses. It was in the work of these two scholars that the reaction against the conventional criticism may have said to be to have begun. And as each succeeding year has brought further discoveries, the reaction has gained in intensity. It's been fun to watch them. I don't know, but 10 years ago, I sat down for about, I don't know, six, eight, 10 months. And the only goal was to assess pedagogical criticism. And I got into all kinds of journals, academic journals. I was down at university and I could access different libraries. And it was, I went in suspecting that the house had collapsed and I came out saying, yeah, the house is falling down. Even in my own lifetime. <sighs> Let's see. Let's, uh, it has become clear that while one may assign to the various documents absolute and relative dates, their material can be ranked in no neat chronological progression. 
nor can the documents themselves be used to support an equally neat picture of the evolution of Israel's religion. But this has meant that Belhousianism in its classical form has all but ceased to exist. While the documentary hypothesis itself has been forcibly placed in a new light. And this is 1960. I mean, he's anticipating the demise. There's a copy of it. Such a statement, it must be emphasized, by no means implies that the documentary hypothesis has been abandoned. It rose independently of the views of Valhausen and his school and stands or falls independently of them. And so far, at least, it seems in general to have stood, with certain exceptions to be noted. One can say that the virtual unanimity of scholarship still adheres to the classical documents with those documents ranged in classical order. And I've got to go along with them because I need a PhD in approval. Here, the prediction of peak quotas above seems in the main to have been correct. Debate has continued lively enough on numerous points of details, but one senses no general tendency to alter the conventional theory. One, for example, the dates of the various documents cannot be said to have been a closed question, especially as regards D, the early part of the period witnessed a warm agreement on the subject with the generally accepted date called into question from two sides by those who would place its composition after the exile and by those who would push it back to the days of Solomon. The former view was pressed by scholars such as Holscher and Horst in Germany, Kennett in England, and Barry in America. The latter was supported by scholars in Great Britain and the continent Stark, Ostreicher and Welch, and more recently, E. Robertson has placed the composition of Deuteronomy as back as early as Samuel. Oh, my goodness. But both attacks may be said to have played themselves out without appreciably denting the established tradition. Okay, blah, blah, blah. I'm just going to go down to the end of the page. It's the same old blah, blah. It's, we're going to call it... Verse 2 of Epiphany 135. Manifest at Jordan stream, prophet, priest, and king supreme, and a king, a wedding guest, in Godhead manifest. Manifest in power divine, changing water into wine, anthems to the addressed, God in man made manifest. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Godspeed.